Well, hey, everyone. God bless you. This is Fred Krupp coming to you from the Healing Rooms Apostolic Center here in Santa Maria, California. And I've been doing a series of messages on how to be ready for the days ahead. And today I want to talk to you about being dressed for battle. And this is part one of a few messages I will do on this. So you, how many of you know that we're in a spiritual battle? Um, let me, I see that hand. That's right. Uh, we're in a spiritual battle, right? And it's be becoming uh, increasing uh, in its strength and uh, in the conflicts that are happening, uh, the battle between good and evil, between light and darkness. And so, you know, uh, the Apostle Paul, he anticipated that we would be in a spiritual battle. And so he actually gave us some instructions on how to be prepared or ready for the battle, right? You already are guessing it. I'm going to be talking to you about putting on the armor of God. And uh, I would subtitle this, keeping your armor on and keeping it shining, right? So here we're going to go to Ephesians chapter 6. For those of you that are joining me on Facebook, I'm talking about how to be dressed for battle. And, uh, and so make sure you click share. Uh, make sure you subscribe to my YouTube channel so you won't miss any in this series. And again, this is part one on being dressed for battle. So I'm going to start with uh, reading to you from Ephesians chapter 6 verses 10 through 18. Here's the Apostle Paul. He says this. He says, finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles or the deceptions of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against the spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. That's important for you to understand. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God. The second time he's bringing it up. Take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand. Stand, therefore, having girded your waist with truth and having put on the breastplate of righteousness and having shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Above all, he says, taking the shield of faith with which you will be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked one and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God, praying always with all prayer and supplication in the spirit, be watchful to this end with all perseverance and supplication for all the saints. Let's pray and let's ask the Holy Spirit to really write the word of God on our heart for this to become more than a nice teaching, but an application that we can apply every day in our lives and we can be fully clothed with the armor of God. So let's pray. We just join together with me. Father, we thank you again that your word says you have provided us everything we need through your precious promises that we need that pertains to life and godliness in Christ Jesus. Lord, you have not left us alone, but you have given us everything we need to win the battle against darkness and against the forces of wickedness. So Lord, I pray that we would begin to be reminded and we, for those that have never heard this before, that we would have a fresh and new revelation and understand what the armor of God is and how to put it on and how it applies to us. You know, how do we activate that army, uh, uh, that armor, so that we can effectively resist the devil, knowing that we can move forward in the battle and take more ground for Jesus. So, Lord, I thank you for helping us. Holy Spirit, I ask you again now, speak to us in Jesus' name amen and amen. Can you say amen to that? Well, I want to read that passage again to you in the New Living Translation. Here's the Apostle Paul. This is the same passage, Ephesians 6, verses 10 through 18. He says a final word. So, you know, if somebody is giving you a final word, this is the most important one that you need to hear. A final word, he says, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Put on all of God's armor so that you'll be able to stand firm against all the strategies of the devil. For we are not fighting against flesh and blood enemies, 
but against evil rulers and authorities of the unseen world, against the mighty powers of this dark world, against the evil spirits in the heavenly places. Therefore, he says, put on every piece of God's armor so that you will be able to resist the enemy in the time of evil. Then after the battle, you will still be standing firm. Stand your ground, putting on, and then he tells us what to put on, the belt of truth, the body armor of God's righteousness, the shoes, for shoes, put on the peace that comes from the good news so that you will be fully prepared. In addition to all of these, hold up the shield of faith to stop the fiery arrows of the devil. Put on salvation as your helmet and take the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God, and pray in the spirit at all times on every occasion. Stay alert and be persistent in your prayers for all believers everywhere. So here Paul is telling us one of the major keys to, that will help us to be ready for the days ahead is that we are to be fully clothed with the armor of God. So in this session, I'm not going to go into depth in all the armor. I'll be doing that in the next couple of sessions. I'll break down each part of the armor and talk about what it is and what it means to you and I. But in this session, I want to give you an overview of what Paul is trying to get across here and talking to us about how to be ready for the days ahead. So the first point I want to make with you is that we need to understand that we're in a spiritual battle fighting against spiritual forces. In 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 3 and 4, Paul writes, the same Paul that wrote that, that we should put on the armor of God, he says, for though we walk in the flesh, we do not war according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, but divinely powerful for the destruction of of fortresses. So Paul is talking about in Ephesians 6 and here in 2 Corinthians chapter 10, he's talking about the fact that we're in a war. He said, well, I didn't, you know, I didn't get saved to get in a war. Well, sorry. Once you got saved, once you were born again, you chose sides. Amen. You chose to be a part of the kingdom of God, the kingdom of light, the kingdom of God's dear son. And once you did that, now you have an advocate, an advocate or an enemy, not advocate, but an enemy, an adversary that wants to steal, kill, and destroy from you. Especially, and by the way, this most important thing he wants you to think is that he doesn't exist, that he's not there, that there really isn't any battle going on. But I don't think, you know, I, I don't, unless you have not watched any news lately, you have been locked up in a cave for the last 20 years uh, and, you know, hiding out there. Uh, I don't, even if you were in a cave, I think you are aware there is a battle and it's a spiritual battle. There's a spiritual war that's going on. And you and I are go to be engaged in that spiritual war. And so um, here's what I found. And that is that one of the reasons that we get defeated uh, as Christians is because we're fighting the wrong battle with the wrong enemy. We think that, you know, it's, it's our spouse that's the problem. It's our boss that's the problem. It's where we live that's the, that's the problem. It's our government that's the problem. You know, it's, uh, it, it's, you know, my neighbors that are the problem. But the real problem is that you and I are engaged in a spiritual battle with spiritual forces of wickedness. And we need to understand you know, who we're really fighting fighting against. Because see, they're going to, uh, their whole, uh, you know, hope is that you remain ignorant of their reality and how they work. And, but Paul says we're not to be ignorant of the ways that the devil works. That's right. And we're to know, we're to understand how the enemy functions. We're not to study the enemy, but we are to be aware that he is at work and how he works. And once you understand that, then you know that you can defeat him if you have the right weapons. Come on. So number one was we need to understand that we are in a spiritual battle fighting against spiritual forces. The second point I want to make, and that is that we are not fighting with people, but with fallen angels, demonic forces who work from darkness from the second heaven and here on earth. And so, again, these are called 
forces of darkness, forces of wickedness. Paul says here in Ephesians chapter 6, he says, for our struggle, verse 12, our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the powers, against the world forces of this darkness, against the spiritual forces of wickedness in the heavenly places. So here Paul is saying, you better understand who your enemy really is. And your enemy is not the people that are around you. Now, some of those are their enemies in the sense that they've given themselves over to evil and they're allowing the enemy to work through their lives. And again, uh, and the Bible does talk about wicked people and people that are uh, bent on evil and so and so on. Uh, but we're the real battle that you and I are to win is that we are to understand that we're fighting against rulers, the powers, against the forces of darkness, uh, the King, New King James calls it, principalities, powers, and rulers of darkness and forces of wickedness. So that's who we're really fighting against, okay? So we're in a spiritual battle. And again, the enemy would like nothing better than that you don't believe that he exists and that he's not around. Uh, I heard a, a man of God speak uh, that had died and gone to heaven uh, here some years back. And while he was there, you know, people asked him, uh, when you were there from heaven, you can see what's going on on earth. He, uh, is there a demon behind every tree? And his answer was, no, there are five demons behind every tree. So we're engaged in a spiritual battle. So if we're going to win this battle, it's important for us to identify the, and who the enemy really is, right? Uh, Jesus said this, when Jesus was standing before Pilate, and Pilate was saying, hey, don't you know I have the power to put you to death or to let you go? And Jesus said to Pilate in John 18, 36, he said, my kingdom is not of this world, for if my kingdom were of this world, then my servants would be fighting so that I would not be handed over to the Jews. But as it is, my kingdom is not of this realm. So that's why when you look in the New Testament, you look in the book of Acts, you don't see uh, the Christians all taking up arms, and we're going to go out, and we're going to conquer countries, and we're going to defeat everybody uh, in the first century. Now, later, they got messed up in the in the time of the Crusades, and they thought, oh, that's what we're supposed to do. We're supposed to conquer all the evil people with, you know, with weapons, with physical weapons, and so on. But you don't see uh, Peter and James and John and and all the disciples, uh, you know, after Jesus rose from the dead and they got baptized in the Holy Spirit, they all did, didn't go out and start buying up, a num you know, a bunch of weapons so they could go out and they could defeat everybody that didn't believe in Jesus. So we're not fighting in the, in the physical realm and we're not fighting people. We are fighting in the spiritual realm and we're fighting against force, forces of wickedness. And so uh, that's the second thing. The third thing I want to say about this, and those of you that are joining me, I'm talking about are you dressed for the battle? Okay, uh, and it's important for you and I to understand that we're in a spiritual battle and we need to be dressed for it and ready to defeat the enemy. Here's the third point I want to make, and that is don't, we don't fight with our strength or our ability, but with God's supernatural power and supernatural weapons. That's why Paul here in Ephesians 6 verse 10, he starts off the whole thing by saying, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. Now I'm going to talk about that in a uh, in one of my next videos talking about how to be dressed for battle. But the fact is, this is not a battle that you can fight with your own physical, mental, and emotional abilities. Your physical, mental, and emotional abilities are no match against fallen angels and demons. Now, if you go back and look at the power of angels and demons, uh, you know, if you look in the Old Testament and you see them activated and what they did, they have great power. So you can't fight them from, you know, by with physical things or with your pea brain, come on, or with, you know, your own personal fortitude and your personal strength. Uh, Peter discovered that when uh, Jesus said, you're all going to deny me. And Peter said, no, I'm not ever going to deny you. I'm going to die for you. And Peter and Jesus said, Peter, will you die for me? He says, I'm telling you that tonight that you're going to deny me three times. And remember how Peter, when he was there uh, in the courtyard where Jesus was taken and uh, he, they were asking him, 
you know, are you're one of his disciples, aren't you? And he said, no, I'm not. And Jesus told him, you're going to deny me three times, and then you're going to hear the rooster crow. Well, Peter, he was used to fighting battles with his own strength. Evidently, he was a strong guy, and we don't know if he's a great big guy or what, but we know that he was he was a guy that was used to, remember, he's the guy in the garden who brought a sword with him, and then when they began to arrest Jesus, he cut off the ear of, uh, you know, one of the high priest's uh, servants. So this is a guy that's used to fighting uh, in the physical realm. And he thought he would be strong. But listen, when he was there in that courtyard, he faced an enemy that was much greater and much more powerful than him. And that was the forces of wickedness and the power of darkness. And so he was defeated immediately. In Zechariah 4, 6, uh, the Bible says this, says, then he said to me, this is God speaking, this is the word of the Lord to Zerubbabel saying, not by might, nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord of hosts. And so you and I need to understand we cannot fight this battle from the physical, with our physical abilities, our mental abilities, all those kind of things. We have to fight it with spiritual power. Uh, Jesus then told his disciples after he rose from the dead in Acts chapter 1, verse 8, he said, but you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. So then on the day of Pentecost, the Holy Spirit's power came, and that same Peter who denied Jesus three times stood up in front of all the people, and he began to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ, and 3,000 people were, sa were saved that day. And so what was going on? All of a sudden, he had been filled with Holy Spirit power, which now enabled him to overcome the forces of darkness that would want him to keep from preaching Jesus. Remember, just before this, before Jesus rose from the dead, <clears throat> after he died, Peter and all the rest of the disciples were hiding out. Now, after they got filled with power, they're standing out in the open, proclaiming Jesus boldly. So that was number three. Again, those of you that are joining me on Facebook, I'm talking about how to be dressed for the battle. And I'm on my fourth point here, and that is we must fight spiritual forces with spiritual weapons. That's what Paul's talking about here in Ephesians chapter 6, verses 16 and 17. He names some of the specific pieces uh, uh, for battle. He talks about the shield of faith. He says, above all, taking the shield of faith with which you will be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked one, take the helmet of salvation. Then he says, and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. So he's listing out some of the, uh, the, the weapons that you and I have as born-again believers, followers of Jesus, sons and daughters of living God, members of God's kingdom, we God has, wants to give us and he wants us to activate spiritual weapons in the spiritual battle. In 2 Corinthians 10, 3, which I read earlier, uh, 10, 3 through 4, it says this, for the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, but divinely powerful or filled with divine power for the destruction of fortresses. So if we're going to fight this spiritual battle, we have to fight it with spiritual weapons. The fifth thing I want to share with you, and that is that the key to victory is to stand against the enemy wearing the full armor of God. So Paul is saying this. Now, I'm going to give you a revelation here in just a moment. Uh, about this, but we are, to, he says, having done all, therefore, to stand, stand, and then he said, and before that, he says, put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles or the schemes or the strategies of the devil. So the key to having victory here in the days we're living in and in the days ahead, as this war uh, is going to increase, it's going to get stronger is that you must put on the full armor of God, not just once in a while, but every day. So the key to victory is to make sure you're wearing the full armor of God. Here's number six, and that is that in this passage, you can see that there are four protective pieces of armor, and there is one defensive piece of armor, and then there are uh, two uh, that are actually one that is a 
offensive piece of armor. So here's, this is number six. There are four protective pieces of armor. And he lists them out here in Ephesians 6. He says, therefore, having girded your waist, waist with truth, that's one of them, then put on the breastplate of righteousness. That's the second one. The third one is shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace. And the fourth protective uh, piece of the armor is take on or put on the helmet of salvation. So we have the belt of truth, the breastplate of righteousness, the gospel of the uh, gospel of of, shoe, uh, of peace shoes, and then we have the helmet of salvation. The belt of truth is what holds your life together. It's the basis of our, of our foundation for all the armor. The breastplate. Again, I'm going to go into these in depth in the next few videos. The breastplate of righteousness guards your heart against the accusations and the condemnations of the devil. The gospel of peace shoes stabilize you to stand firm and confident in the midst of the battle. You have peace in the midst of a storm. And the helmet of salvation obviously then guards your mind from the lies and deceptions of of the evil one. So again, now I talked about there are four protective pieces of armor, the belt of truth, the breastplate of righteousness, the gospel uh, uh, of peace shoes, and the helmet of salvation. Here's the seventh point I want to make, and that is, I've already mentioned, and that is there is one defensive weapon that defeats the enemy's attacks every time. That's right. It defeats the enemy's tax every time. That's Ephesians chapter 6, verse 16. He says this, Paul says, above all, or another way to say it is, most importantly, I'm telling you, taking the shield of faith with which you will be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked one. So he calls, he tells them the most important thing you need to do is make sure that you take up and hold up the shield of faith. And so this is our, our defensive weapon. When the enemy begins to shoot arrows and fiery darts, which they are words, they are thoughts that come to you, you've got to learn how to hold up your shield of faith. Now, what I call that is learning how to walk in, stand in, and activate our faith is the key to victory. Here, listen to this. First John, the uh, the the... the uh, John the disciple, in his letter, he writes in 1 John chapter 5, verses 4 and 5, he says this. He says, whatever is born of God overcomes the world, and this is the victory that overcomes the world, even our faith. And who is the one who overcomes the world? But he who believes that Jesus is the Son of God. So here, the apostle John tells us that the key to victory uh, to overcome the world is our faith. And under, so we need to understand how to activate our faith. How do, we, how do we hold up our shield of faith? That was the seventh uh, thing I want to talk about. The eighth thing is that there's one primary offensive weapon that conquers the enemy every time. So the shield of faith wins, it resists the enemy every time, and now we have the one primary offensive weapon that conquers the enemy every time, and that is the sword of the Spirit, Paul says, Ephesians 6, verse 17, the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. So the sword of the Spirit is the Word of God. In Hebrews, the writer of Hebrews, chapter 4, verse 12, says this, for the Word of God is living and active and sharper than any two-edged sword and piercing as far as the division of soul and spirit, both joints and marrow, and able to ju judge the thoughts and intentions of the heart. So here, uh, the writer of Hebrews says that the Word of God is a sword. Amen. That is a sharp, two-edged sword. And then in Revelation 1.16, we see Jesus, when Jesus appeared to John, uh, after Jesus had risen from the dead, and John was on the island of Patmos, and he had a revelation of Jesus Christ, and when he saw him, it says this, he, in his, this is Revelations 1.16, in his right hand, he saw Jesus holding seven stars, and out of his mouth came a sharp two-edged sword. Come on. And so we see that the sword is the word coming out of the mouth of Jesus, and it's the same 
thing that he used against the devil uh, when he was tempted of the devil. And it's at the end of the book of Revelations, he's going to use it to destroy all the wicked uh, in the world and destroy the enemy. So that was number eight. And number eight is that there is one primary uh, weapon, offensive weapon that conquers the enemy every time. So I'm, those of you who are joining me, I'm talking about how to be dressed for the battle. And this is part one, just giving you an introduction to it. And the future uh, videos, I'll be talking, breaking down the armor and talking specifically what it is and how do we put it on. Here's my ninth point for this video, and that is prayer in the spirit activates the army. That's going to be a whole session that I'll talk about. But Ephesians 6, 18, uh, Paul says at the end of listing all the armor, he says, praying always with all prayer and supplication in the spirit, being watchful to this end with all perseverance and supplication for all the saints. So prayer is the secret key to activating the armor of God. That was number nine. Number 10, here's an interesting point. Uh, this, is, this just kind of came to me as I was meditating on the scripture. And that is, there is no armor that covers your back. Okay, so what does that mean? So you have all your armor is on the front of you, right? You got the helmet of salvation, the shield of faith, the breastplate of righteousness, the girdle of truth. You got the gospel shoes. You got the sword of the spirit, but there's nothing covering your back. And so uh, what does that mean? Uh, well, I believe it means that we're always to be moving forward. We're not to be going backward. Uh, Romans 13, verses 12 to 14 says this, The night is far gone, the day is at hand. So let us cast off the works of darkness and put on the armor of light. Let us walk properly in the daytime, not in orgies and drunkenness and sexual immorality and sensuality, not in quarreling and jealousy, but put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh to gratify its desires. Now, I want you to notice that the Apostle Paul calls the armor the armor of light. Then he also calls it putting on Jesus Christ. So here it is. This Here's the revelation. Come on. You're, I hope you're ready for this. Again, those of you that are joining me right now, I'm talking about how to be dressed for the battle ahead. All right. So here it is. So why don't we have any back armor? Because we're always facing forward. And why is all the armor on the front of us? Because when the enemy looks at you, first off, he's going to get blinded by the light of God's glory. The armor of God reflects the glory of God. That's why Paul calls it in Romans chapter 13, put on the armor of light. So when the enemy looks at you, he's blinded. He is darkness. And you know what? The Bible tells us that, the, uh, that there is darkness in, in John 1, 5, the, Jesus said, the light shines in darkness, and the darkness has not overcome, overcome it. In other words, the, the light cannot, pre, in darkness cannot prevail against the light. That's right. When you're in a dark room, and you throw on the switch, and the light comes on, the darkness flees away. That's why the Bible says, submit therefore to God, and resist the devil, and he'll flee from you. So here, why don't we have any uh, armor covering our back because we're always face forward. And here's the second insight, and that is that when the enemy, when you have the armor on, when the enemy looks at you, he sees Jesus. And he already knows he's been defeated because the Bible says when Jesus went up uh, after being crucified, died, and rose from the dead, it says he went in Colossians, it tells us that he defeated all the principalities and powers, and he stripped them. All the, the heavenly hosts that were of evil were stripped by him and made a public display over them, a public display, and they were, and it says he triumphed over them through the cross. So the cool thing is, is when you are wearing the armor and the enemy comes at you, you look like Jesus. Come on. That is so powerful, isn't it? Now, here's the last thing I want to say, and that is, Peter says in Matthew 16, verse 18, and I tell you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. So I'm talking about the idea that there's no armor on the back, which means here uh, Jesus is telling to Peter, I'm going to give you the keys of the kingdom, and he says, I'm going to build a church that the gates of hell cannot resist. In other words, you're always moving forward. You're taking 
you know, you know, you're taking territory for the kingdom of God. Every time you win a lost soul to Jesus, you're taking territory for God. So again, uh, this whole session, I've been talking to you about the importance, if you're going to be successful and moving forward, or how do we, what do we do to prepare for the days ahead, you need to make sure you are dressed for battle by putting on the whole armor of God. And so I made several points that I think were helpful to you. Uh, I talked about, number one, make sure that you understand that we're in a spiritual battle. Number two, understand that we're not fighting with people, but with fallen angels and demonic forces of wickedness and, the, and darkness. Number three, that our, we don't fight in our own strength and power, but we fight with the supernatural power of God. And then number four, that we must understand that we've we fight spiritual forces with spiritual weapons. Number five, that the key to victory is to stand against the enemy wearing the full armor of God. Number six, and that is that there were four protective pieces of armor, which were the belt of truth, the blessed breastplate of righteousness, the gospel shoes of peace, and the helmet of salvation. There's one off, uh, defensive weapon, and that is the shield of faith with which we squelch the, the enemy's fiery darts. And then there was one primary offensive weapon, which is the sword of the spirit or the word of God. And then all these things, number nine, and that is that are all activated by praying in the spirit. Come on. And then lastly, I talked about there is there's, there's no armor. If you haven't noticed, there's no armor on the back. And that's because we're also always going to be moving forward and that it's called the armor of light. So when the enemy looks at us, when we're wearing the army, he's blinded by the light and the glory of God. And the Bible says, put on Jesus. It says we are to put on Jesus uh, in, uh, uh, he talks about putting on Jesus uh, the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh to gratify its, uh, its desire. So we're putting on the armor of light and we're putting on Jesus. So when the enemy comes at us, he sees Jesus. Well, I hope this was helpful to you. Uh, make sure you uh, click share. Make sure you subscribe to my YouTube channel because this, again, is part of the series on how to be ready for the days ahead. And uh, make sure that you begin to, you get really clear, even if you've heard messages on the armor of God, it's important. It's not enough to hear a message about it. Are you wearing the armor of God every day? And so I, I want to encourage you, I want to pray for you that you'll continue in this series with me and you'll understand how do I, what is the armor of God, each piece, and how do I put it on? So in the next session, I'll be talking about different parts of the armor of God and explaining what they are and how we put them on. All right. In the meantime, I want you to know that God loves you and uh, Jesus loves you, and I love you, and I want to pray in closing for you. Maybe you're in a battle right now, but I have good news for you, and that is that Jesus has the victory for you, and I want to pray for you right now. Father, I pray whatever they're battling, I pray in the name of Jesus that your word says, this is the victory that overcomes the world, even our faith. And I pray for the activation of the shield of faith, whatever they're facing, if they're getting hit by the fiery darts of the enemy, if they're being defeated in their thoughts, in their, in their moral life, in any area of their life, uh, they're in depression, discouragement, they're fighting sickness. Father, we just release the victory of the cross of Jesus Christ and the blood that speaks better than the blood of Abel. Father, we thank you. There's power in the cross and there's power in the blood of Jesus. And Father, I pray for my brothers and sisters that they would become strong in the Lord and in the strength of your might. I pray that in Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Well, again, God loves you, I love you, and Jesus loves you. Be blessed, my brothers and sisters.